Hello, everyone. It's uh, one o'clock and we're going to get our uh, speakers event slash webinar started. Um, I'm Chris Jokum, the Vice President for Education of Chinese Historical and Cultural Project. Um, this is an event in our speaker series and for the first time it's uh, simultaneously an event that's being sent out over Zoom. And those of you who um, are listening through Zoom, you are in the majority. Uh, there are many more of you. Um, it's also a kind of reunion for the women and men who um, lived in the Chinese children's orphanages, um, the Zhongmei Boys, Chinese Boys Orphanage and the Mingguang Chinese Girls Orphanage. Um, and today we will hear their stories and information on the historical and social aspects of the two institutions and the people who were a part of them. Um, on the screen, we will see the names of the um, participants and uh, you can see that um, we have several speakers representing each of the groups. Um, we have Richard Marr, William Lee, and Ray Tom. Uh, Tom Panos uh, was not able to join us. Um, and representing Ming Kuang Chinese girls, we have Janice Chang, uh, Elena Wong Viscovich, Helen Wong Loy, Mary Wong Young, Amy Fong Albritton, and Dolly Tom Jiang. And you will hear some of these people in person, uh, four of them, you'll know very soon who they are. Two of them are sitting next to me, uh, Richard Moore and William Lee. And you will after that see here in person, um, Janet Jang and Elena Wong Um, I'd like to thank them for being here today and thank those who are participating uh, virtually on Zoom. I'd like to thank our CHCP um, volunteers who have been working on this event. Uh, Erwin Wong, who uh, actually was the creator and planner of the event, um, had an injury and is not able to be with us here today. Uh, Dave Yick, uh, CHCP current president is here today and uh, has been in his role today as a, as a worker bee, helping out any way he can. Uh, Brenda Wong, a former CHCP president and uh, helper at many events, uh, coordinator of our student docent program and so forth and so on. Um, Edith Gong, who uh, ran the <coughs> registration um, in her role as the vice president for uh, marketing and outreach. And finally, uh, David Wu, uh, the man behind the camera, so to speak, who is uh, making sure that I'm on camera and you can hear me. And later on, when we show slides and videos, uh, that, that will all work out very well. So thank you to David. Um, thank you to the other CHCP volunteers. And thank you to all of the guests that are in here in person, as well as out there in Zoom land. I will now turn things over to uh, Richard Marr and William Lee from Zhongmei Chinese Boys School. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, CCHP. David Yick and Mizu David and Edwin. We appreciate it very much for if it was not for these people, we would not have the opportunity to give our presentation. I'm getting old and I'm not going to give another presentation in the future. So please pay attention because we're all not going to have the energy to give a presentation in the future. Now my role, there are going to be three speakers, maybe four. That will make the presentation. I am not going to talk about Jungmei home experience. I am going to talk about the background of Jungmei home. And William and Ray would talk about their personal experience. The story of Jung Mei Home for Chinese Boys. The legal title, according to 
the land use historical records is Chung Mei home for Chinese boys. Just emphasize that, kind of interesting. It started in 1923, not in El Cerrito, but in West Berkeley. They had 66 boys at that time. And by the time in 1928, they were located at Ashby and San Pablo Avenue across the street from the H.J. Hines Pickle Factory. You people don't know about H.J. Hines, but you probably remember the 57 varieties of H.J. of Hines soup. Well, anyway, they were in that same neighborhood. What happened here, interesting, is that because of industrialization, the Jungmi home people could not get a home in a good neighborhood. So they had to move a house in West, into West Berkeley near Emeryville. And they remained there until 1928. So it happened in the summer of 1928, they purchased five and a half acres of land, which is dairy land, in El Cerrito, California. They paid $10,000, $3,000 down and $2,500 in single annual payments to make the payment of $10,500. Now, due to the rapid urbanization and industrialization, in the fall of 1935, prior to that, 1934 actually, they had to move. Because they had the land, five and a half acres, they did not have the building. So they decided to raise money and it would cost $80,000 in that time for the building that exists today at Hill and Elm Street. They had $20,000. So they needed $60,000, $60,000 in the middle of depression. How in the world can you get $60,000? People were lucky to get a dollar from them. So it was a very, very difficult situation for the people that are born in that era. Well, they did it. What they did was that they sold wood and they put on production. And one of the productions was known as It Happened in Zandavia, a musical production which they went through the various venues like the Baptist Church, uh, the other venues that they did, and they raised money that way. They also got donation here from the American Baptist Home Mission Society, the San Francisco City Baptist Union, the National Dollar Store, the Square and Circle Club, which is a professional Chinese women's club, and the Chinese communities in the Bay Area. By the time they did this in 19 months, ladies and gentlemen, they raised the money, $80,000 in 19 months. And so what happened? In 19... 1934, going on to 1935, they had a dedication. It was happening June 31st, 1935. They had a dedication at El Cerrito Hill and Elm Street. And here's a fact. A unit from the Ming Guang Chinese Girls Home was part of the dedication. A lot of girls don't know about that, but I didn't even know that they had a marching unit. So they dedicate the building. And by that time, they had 77 boys attending Jung Mei Home. In addition to food, shelter, and clothing, Jung Mei Home, under the leadership of Dr. Charles R. Shepherd, taught the boys to be leaders in their communities through prudence, sharing, leadership, 
and strong Christian values. And the captain said, that's Dr. Shepard, the genuine line, healthy, stalk worthy Christian and social activity, plus fun and hilarity were part of our education of Jume Home. And that's how I'm going to talk about Jume Home. And now I want to turn control of the meeting to William Lee, one of our senior Jung Mei alumni, and will give his personal and strong experience of Jung Mei Ho. William. Thank you, Richard. My name is William Lee. I was orphaned at the age of four and a half years. Chung Mei Ho's age requirement was five, so I had to wait. Chung Mei was my home until I left at the age of 15. The years were 1940 to 1950. The day I entered Chung Mei home, I felt dumped and abandoned. <clears throat> My first day morning was total confusion. I don't know a word of English. I woke up to the sound of a bell that I didn't know what to do. Then a second bell ring. I'm still looking around. And when the second bell rang, the other 13 kids jumped out of bed, started getting dressed. Well, I didn't know what, so I copied them. After getting dressed and washed up, to, the bells rang again, and all the kids headed to the chapel for morning service. Morning service consisted of a spiritual hymn and a Bible lesson. This was typical weekday routine that lasted approximately 15 minutes. After service, we went into the dining room for breakfast. Breakfast consisted of cereal with milk and oatmeal. Some call it mush. <laughs> Meals were sparse with not much meat at hand. <laughs> Through the years morning services, we learned the Chung Mei purpose, the Chung Mei chant, and the Chung Mei alphabet. The purpose and the chant were pre-1940 before I got there. The Chung Mei alphabet came after World War II, ended in 1945. These were just some of Captain's teachings that were life's lessons. I remember after teaching us the Chung Mei alphabet, Captain said, it's not easy to be a 100% Chung Mei boy. But he wanted us to strive for it. I think the purpose, the chant, and the alphabet were his building blocks to make us men. One hymn we sang many, many times was, God send us men. And Captain had us sing it as, God make us men. These were the building blocks for creating good character. During tough and uncertain times in my life, I remember the Chung Mei chant that goes like this. For it's easy enough to be happy when life flows along like a song. But the man worthwhile is the man that can smile when everything goes dead wrong. So equip yourselves like men, be strong. And though everything seems dead against you, carry on, carry on, carry on. That was you did a good job on us. When I entered the military service, I was prepared. I always remember, oh, obey orders promptly and cheerfully, as stated in the Chung Mei alphabet. Thank you, Captain, for giving me and all the other Chung Mei boys these life lessons that you taught us, and we hope we make you proud. Thank you. Anything else, Wayne? How about the bank of good behavior? Okay. We'll see. 
Any questions? Okay. We'll have the Q&A later. Right. David, is uh, <coughs> Ray on? Hello. Can you hear me all right? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, are we ready to go? Okay, Ray, you're on. Okay. Hi, my name is Ray Tom. Uh, today, well, I'm part of one of the younger alumni. I'm uh, 81 years old. So it's been almost 75 years since I went to Jomei. I was, <clears throat> my, my twin brother and I, we had, I have an identical twin brother. <clears throat> was seven years old and in the second grade when we went into Jungmei home. And we were there for seven years. We left the home in 1954 when the home closed. <clears throat> we were probably the only identical twins uh, in Jungmei's history. I don't think there were any others. <clears throat> um, in... <clears throat> When the home closed, then we returned to our home um, in San Francisco. We had an apartment on uh, Clay Street in Mason. And um, from there, we went to um, Francis Francisco Junior High and George Washington High School and then uh, to State College. But why was I there? Um, my father was a, a single parent. And he had worked at the Chinese Times uh, as the printing press operator and could not care for us during the day when he was working. So uh, Jome Home was the place for us. <clears throat> a dad during the war was a master machinist at uh, uh, building uh, ships for the U.S. Navy at uh, Vallejo's Mare Island and also San Francisco San Francisco Point. <clears throat> See, I have some notes too, like Will, but I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, after after high school, with a, my brother and I went to SF State. We got our degrees in in education. Um, we began as teachers, and then we, we got our masters and got uh, our administrative credentials. And then later on, both of us um, got our doctoral degrees from the University of Pacific in education. Uh, my brother ended up as the second charge of all the San Francisco schools as the associate superintendent. I became, uh, I moved to Stockton <clears throat> uh, in 1966. And <clears throat> uh, after teaching and being, being a school principal, I, uh, after my doctorate, I supervised principals, and uh, we both worked for the school districts of close to 40 years. Um, another thing we did as twins, we married sisters. So we did quite a few things alike. <clears throat> After we left home, it was a big adjustment, you know, being an institutionalized uh, setting like Zhongmei, which is very organized and structured, when we went back to home, uh, it was a big adjustment. We had to kind of learn how to again behave like uh, normal people <laughs> with a normal family. And it was uh, it took a little while for us to, to make the transition back. Well, I guess it was like maybe a, a person that's been in prison for like 10 years and then you, you put back in society and, and it's always a big adjustment. So for us, um, it took a little while for us, for us to get uh, used to um, being back in San Francisco. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that uh, Richard wanted us to, to uh, talk about is so what we liked about being in, in Zhongmei. And one of the best things I, I liked was Dr. Shepard. I knew he cared for us. He cared for the Chinese people. Um, he made it his life. And uh, I was really very impressed with his dedication and help to us. <clears throat> I also like the structure and organization at the home. It made things go easy and, and it wasn't hard. To, it, there wasn't a whole lot of decisions you had to make because it was kind of decided for you. I liked the strong Baptist focus. He, had a, he was a missionary in China 
and um, he everything was uh, religious and Christian focused. Every morning, one of the things I liked very much was every morning we had chapel. And one of the things I liked about chapel was singing the old hymns. And I, I sing those every day. And I enjoy, enjoy it very much. I like the Bible stories that the dormitory mothers read to us uh, at night before we went to sleep. And uh, I still remember many of the stories that they read. Um, when we walked to school, uh, we would walk in the columns of two, and that was kind of fun. We walked, we marched to, to our elementary school, and we marched back home. It was about a two-mile walk. And one of the best things during the year was in the summer, we would go to Camp Timbertal uh, uh, campgrounds, which basically was a Girl Scouts um, camp, and we spent a week there, and it was a whole lot of fun. Another thing I think most of us enjoy was something called canteen. And that was uh, one day a week when we get to go to like a little uh, shop and, and uh, get candy for, for our uh, enjoyment. Uh, I liked my teachers at Castro Elementary and also Portola uh, Junior High School. And they were very kind to us. And they, they knew also that we were in a, a basically an orphanage. Um, in some years, we were able to march as uh, Zhongmei cadets in San Francisco's Chinatown's 1010 Parade. And that was kind of fun. And the preparation for that was kind of fun. I was never a drummer, but I was able to march. And uh, it was, uh, was a good, good experience. Uh, one of the things that my dad did was uh, we were allowed to have um, monthly visits. He would come to Zhongmei and take my brother now uh, to, uh, to see a movie or somewhere in town and then return home. Uh, the other thing I liked was uh, be, being able to walk down to the local theater and watch movies. And then the, uh, another fun thing that we did during, at the home was we can get permission to hike up to uh, the golf course uh, in the El Cerrito Hills. Richard, how's my time doing? Am I doing okay? Yeah. Okay. I about finish. <clears throat> what did I dislike being at the home? There wasn't very much I disliked. It was we just un I we understood it was a a Jongmei, uh, like a little military academy, and there was rules that we had to follow. So there wasn't really much to dislike because, um, well, one thing I think most kids would dislike would be not being away from home but that wasn't our choice. How did my seven years stay at Jomei affect me? That's one of the questions that Richard wanted us to talk about. One of the things that had a major effect was uh, it affected my, uh, the way I lived my life. Uh, while I was there, when I was 12 years old, I gave my life to Christ. And that decision and choice uh, affected my whole life and to, 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 to today. Um, everything I did in my job and how I raised my family uh, was based on uh, values that I learned in Jomei Home. And, you know, um, Will had read to you the Jomei chant. And for me, that was part of one of the most things that affected my life. And again, I'd like to read it again to you for those that um, in the audience that have not heard this before. Uh, by Dr. Charles R. Shepherd. <clears throat> God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. And no good thing will he withhold from him that walk uprightly. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. For it is easy enough to be happy when life flows along like a song. But the boy worthwhile is the boy that can smile 
when everything goes dead wrong. So quit you like men, be strong. And though everything seems dead against you, carry on, carry on, carry on. That had um, that just that chant had a major effect on my life. Um, Richard mentioned that many of us that left the home became leaders. Uh, I became a leader in my school district. I became um, a supervised principals. I became a leader in my community. I was the president of the Chinese Culture Society of, of Stockton. I was a board member at Zhonghua. Um, I belong to the state superintendent of schools, uh, Asian Caucus. So I did many things, but partly because of the training that I received at Zhongmei and the focus. And like Will, when I went there, uh, we, I spoke very little uh, English because at home, my dad just spoke Chinese. And so it, it was also kind of a hard thing to kind of to adjust to that too. I about finish, I think. I guess that's basically it. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I, I um, it just appreciate it. Yeah, I see your signs to stop. I'm stopping. Okay, thank you, Ray. I think I have three more minutes I have to share with you. I just have to share. This is awesome. Thanks to Bill's son, Mark. We had a dinner at Dublin last month, seven alumni, and Mark, his son, came up from Los Angeles to attend the luncheon. He's not a Jumui boy, but his godfather, Philbert, who's no longer with us, was the godfather. And in the thought of sharing, Mark gave each seven of us $500 each, seven of us, $3,500 each, because she wanted to share. Evidently, he received some money from Filbert, the godson. But not only this, ladies and gentlemen, he said that as long as you have lunches in the future with the Zhongwei boys, I will pay for it. My goodness, this is sharing to Nancy, the mother, and to William, and basically sharing to Jung Mei Ho. This values, I've never heard of it. I was overwhelmed, but I had to share with you. But now I'm gonna to have to turn control of the meeting to the ladies who's gonna outspeak us. But before I do that, I'd like to go to Christian to do the moderation. Okay, so can we have a hand of applause for Christian? <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, we're going to have now the changing of the guard, and uh, Richard and William will have uh, seats to join the audience, and uh, later, Elena Wong Viskovich and Janet Chang will be the speakers. Welcome, and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Bing Huang portion of our joint event with Chiang Mai. We have a very exciting program for you. We will have El Dr. Elena Wong Viskovich provide the history and the context. After that, we'll have four lovely alumni sharing their personal stories. Sisters Helen Wong Loy, Mary Wong Young, Amy Fong, Albrighton and Dolly Tom J. Then Dr. Viskovich will describe our quest since 2017 in fact or fiction. Our program will then conclude with a haiku poem penned by our big sister, Nona Mock Wyman. And now, without further delay, presenting the history, I'd like to introduce our expert academic researcher, Dr. Elena Wong-Biskovich. Thank you, Janet. I want 
to speak to you about a matter that's been close to my heart for many years. Something must be done for the needy small boys in the community. The orphans, half orphans, fondlings, and the children of broken homes. There are so many of them. We have been sheltered them, sheltering them since they were infants and cannot do that much longer. We have five boys right here in this house, which was intended for only the young women. They need a man's influence. They need a father. This dialogue between Ms. Cameron and Dr. Shepard in 1919 at the Presbyterian Mission Home began to refocus on the growing needs of children in a time when San Francisco Chinatown, religious agencies and social workers were trying to consolidate and eliminate services during a period of shrinking dollars. Prior to 1919, the rescue and housing of Chinese women and girls from human trafficking began in 1874 with Caucasian Presbyterian missionaries in San Francisco. First slide. Twenty-one years later, Donna Dina Cam whoops, go back one please. Donna Dina Cameron joined these missionaries in this dangerous endeavor shortly after her arrival at the Presbyterian Mission Home in 1895. In Cameron's lifetime, records show that she and her staff rescued and sheltered over 3,000 Chinese and later Japanese, Korean, Syrian, and European victims of human trafficking and slavery. While accommodating the rescue victims with shelter, Cameron soon made a place for the young and needy children of Chinatown. The Presbyterian Mission Home swelled um, to, it was, it was overflowing. Next slide. This is the mission home before it was renamed Cameron House. Next slide. <laughs> in 1915, Cameron established Tooker Memorial Home in Oakland for Chinese infants and toddlers. She decided to separate the young innocent children from the victims of human trafficking. Before long, took her home, was overtaxed with more children than the facility could handle. Remove that slide, please. And we know the first Chung Mei home, Berkeley, was then established by Dr. Shepard for young Chinese boys in 1923. Cameron then established Ming Kuang. From 1925 to the 1950s, more than 400 Ming Huang girls and later some boys were helped to their formative years to become productive adults. Please note that at the turn of the 20th century, the once predominantly single Chinese male population transformed to one with families and marriages. It also then brought challenges to a changing family structure and dynamics. The Ming Kuang registered logged the many circumstances why the girls entered Ming Kuang. These are, they were orphans or half orphans without adequate support and or supervision, parents getting a divorce, dysfunctional families, indigent families, violent marriages, non-acceptance of a step-parent, summer boarding for girls of a single parent, emergency refugee status, as well as mental and physical health issues. There were three Ming Kuang homes. 
This one here is 1925, the first Ming Kuang home built in the Oakland Hills for school age, Chinese, Chinese American, and Chinese biracial girls needing help. In 1934, Cameron and her staff sent those girls at Ming Kuang who were suffering from TB and respiratory problems to the rented Sunshine Cottage in Las Gatas to recuperate. Next slide, please. 10 years later, the second Ming Kuang home was built so that the girls could be closer to the Oakland Chinatown community. The campus then in the Oakland Hills was closed. Next. Around 1936-37, the third Ming Kuang home was acquired in Los Gatos. Cameron reorganized the girls into two age groupings. The preschool to sixth grade went to Los Gatos, while the uh, seventh to twelfth grade girls were assigned to open the Oakland campus. Now back to you, Janet. Elena, thank you for your in-depth pre history presentation. I just want to add something to that. And the reason why the homes were created, because in those days, social services did not accept, did not serve Chinese children. So that's what Donna Dina Cameron started. Okay. And now we're going to have our alumni sharing the personal stories. It is my pleasure to introduce sisters Helen Wong Loy and Mary Wong Young. They, there was a sister, Louise, who was a middle sister, and sadly she has passed. By the Ming Huang entry, Mary entered the home at age six in 1930. Mary Wong Young entered the home at age four in 1932. All three sisters lived through the Depression and World War II. All three sisters lived at all three Ming Huang homes. Helen, with a diagnosis of TB, she was moved from Oakland to Sunshine Cottage in Los Gatos to recover. And now we will see two videotapes, uh, one of Helen, one of Mary, and they're together. And um, Terry is, uh, Terry's joining them and Terry is Helen's daughter. So the number one of uh, three are for Helen. Thank you. They're going to ask you questions. Oh. You might have to speak loud. Though. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me, Helen, uh, what year you came to Ming Kuang? And what maybe the, the reasons why you came to Ming Kuang? It's so long ago, I can't remember. <laughs> it's okay. What, what was um, your family like before you came to Ming Kuang? Where did, can I ask a question? Um, how old were you when you went into Ming Kuang? Do you remember? You were about six? Five. Five, five or six. That would make it 1933. Lot, something like that. And where did you live before you went to Ming Kuang? Who did you live with? Did you live with your mom and oh, dad? Uh, I can't remember. It's so long ago. It's so, so long ago. <laughs> you were on a ranch. You were. You were. You were. Oh at a yeah, we lived in Los Gatos. Oh, I said fucking okay, time. No, no, you lived in Newcastle. Newcastle. Oh, before me. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, tell me, what did you like at at Ming Kuang in Los Gatos? I can't remember. It's been so long ago. <laughs> what were some of the things you did there? We used to march around at the courtyard. Do you remember going to school? Yeah, we used to um, cross, cross the way and go to John Swift. John Swift School, yeah. John Swift School. Yeah. Do you remember doing some chores or some work there? Like working for uh, apricot? Farm? Oh, yeah, you always cut fruit for apricot. Cut fruit for lossy. Cut apricots. 
Did you make money for that? Uh, it is, it's on trade, you know, and then you would sell it up for for a can for a dry apricot. And where did the money go that you earned? Ten cents. Ten cents an hour. Ten cents up for the whole thing. We had to take a nap because we we were so young. <laughs> and who got the money? We did. Ten cents. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of money. What did you do with the money? You know, I forgot. Did they let you spend it? Probably give it to the church. That's what I'm thinking too. Living at Ming Kwang, how how did it influence your life? I guess if it wasn't for Meng Kuang, I, I don't know. My, my mother would have sent me to China. I'd be a slave, you know, be a, uh, yeah. Not a slave, but, you know, whatever. Marry me to some Chinese guy. <laughs> Can you remember anything you would change? Um, if you think about your Ming Kuang experience? No. What did you do at Ming Kuang? I don't know. We, I know we got up. I don't know. We used to go to cut fruit for Lossy every summer and camp, you know, camp in one of those barns. Um. Do you remember doing anything with the Chung Mei boys? No. You never saw them there? Well, yeah, we saw them, but we never did anything. They were in um, on the other side. You were sick when you were little. Yeah. What? Why? I forgot what kind of sickness I had. Did you live um, in an infirmary? Infirmary. In the infirmary? Did you have TB? Huh? Did you have TB, tuberculosis? Yeah, probably. And you went into the hospital. Yeah. Did you go to Sunshine, Sunshine Cottage? Cottage, yeah. What do you remember about Sunshine Cottage? We're going to stop here because it's five minutes. Okay. And then so it's a bite. I okay. think you can get it. mind me answering no i think you're asking the questions it's a better prompt okay it's i think it might be hard for her to hear yeah so. well the other thing too is you're clarifying with your brother the question mm -hmm. so, yeah so that's true and your voice is coming out and saying okay so we're going to start so you got to save this one you got to save this one i didn't even save it i'm just going to continue to write it Thank you, David. Could you queue up um, Helen's three of three, please? Thank you. You want to have her introduce herself? What is your name? Helen Lloyd. Helen Wong. And how old are you now? 
98. 98. 98 years young. If you had one thing to say to the Ming Huang teachers and people who took care of you, what would you say to them now? Well, the attention I have, she was what, terrible. What would you say to the other ones, though? They seen I have well, if they were sitting here, what would you say to them? We said, I forgot. Would you say anything to them about how they took care of you? Yeah, Chen I. I know, but what about the nice ones? Did they take... What? Yeah, I forgot. But what would you say to them right now? Thank you. Why? For taking care of us. Because they did a good job? Yeah, they did that. Uh, did they save your life? I guess so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and next we're gonna hear from um, Helen's little sister, Mary. And uh, one of one of three for Mary. I'll be tearing my hair out after that. Uh, Elena gave us some questions to answer about our experiences living at Ming Guang. My older sister, Helen and Louise and I were born in a small uh, town in Placer County where our parents, where our immigrant mother and father settled and worked in a uh, family-run business. In 1930, our mother left the marriage and uh, took us and sought refuge at the Presbyterian Mission in San Francisco. Helen six and Louise four and a half were placed at Mingguang Home, Oakland on McCullen Street. Because I was only two at the time, I went to Baby Cottage or Mei Lan Yun. In 1933, nearing five, I was transferred to the Ming Kwong home site. And then I remember sitting in the middle of a small bed in the nursery when they brought two girls in and introduced them as my sister. Uh, because we were put uh, in our age group, we never interacted, but we did see each other at meal time and the daily prayer services. And those early years were fun time, carefree for us little ones, romping around the tall grass and playing, climbing on the play apparatus. And we had so many playmates. Uh, I do not remember that we were given any uh, uh, assigned chores. I guess we were being uh, slowly nurtured, guided, and shaped into being self-sufficient. Around 1935, Ming Kwong was split into two units and the girls junior high and older were moved to the new building on 9th Street near the Chinatown community. The younger girls relocated to the Los Gatos campus, which was the former summer resident of the Spreco family. It, sit, it sits on the top of a small hill a beautiful greenery and landscape. Uh, we walk 
or ran a mile to and from school every day. But we were required to uh, complete our daily morning chores before we were dismissed. And many times we were late for class. I don't remember ever being kept after school for tardiness, but the school seems to understand and forgave this infraction. infraction. Around 1935, our mother, who had remarried, took my sisters and I out of Mingguang to live with them in San Francisco. And I became closer to my two sisters, Helen and Louise. The marriage failed, so in early December 1941, only I was returned to Mingong home in Oakland until 1945. Um, when a girl reaches the age of 16 or in the 11th or 12th grade, she was assigned a schoolgirl job to finish high school and a placement was usually found in a white middle-class family and we received room and board, a small salary about, of about $10 a month to cover car fare and incidental. And in its change, working as mother's helper after school and weekends, our only day off was the half a day on school day. Since I never learned to cook, I never had to cook for the family, and, but we did many other cho household chores and childcare. And then Mary, three of three. Thank you. So, okay, so you both were sisters. We at, didn't know we had sisters. Uh, we yeah, didn't. that's true. You didn't because know. we were in different age groups, so we didn't interact. Yes, but then you found out you were sisters, and now I see that you are great sisters together, and you do you know you visit each other, you send each other cards. What do you think, even though your Ming Fong experiences, you were apart from each other, why, how did you get to maintain your, your family? Because when I was growing up at Ming Guang and I went back, Helen was always there for me and she was like my second mother. She came to my graduation and high school uh, the only one representing uh, us homegirls that graduated that year. And she has always been there helping me out, letting me come to visit her and Fred and the family. Fred's my husband. What about, how did you remember spending your time with Auntie Louise and Auntie Jenny? We what didn't you, know we had sisters. After. Right, but yes. then after the fact, when you found out you had sisters, do you remember seeing them at meal times and talking I with guess them? I I forgot. You forgot? It's hard to you remember. know, we weren't that close. But we're, you became close yeah. after you yeah. left. After mother took us out of Mingguang, then we stayed in the apartment. Yeah, you stayed really close together. So Helen has been always been like a second mother to me, even to this day. And we lost Louise a few years ago, but she was over 92, also. Louise. My sister, our sister. There, you were, you at the time, you're, now you're how old again? 
98. Your? 94. And Auntie would have been 96. 96. So there's two years difference between each of you. And also, Helen, when you and Fred moved to San Mateo, you and Fred uh, helped mother and her husband buy an apartment house in yeah. San Mateo. So Louise moved down and stayed with mother. And yeah, she that's how to... we remain close. Yes, because she used to live in the duplex next to Papa as you're going there. Yeah, so that's how you 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 really kept the bond going is because you even though you were apart, you stuck together as adults. Because she was my second mother. Ah, she was good to me and good to my family. I remember taking having your kids come to our house and working at the grocery store. Because remember Chuck came in and worked at the grocery store? Remember yes. Chuck? Yes. Came in and worked at the grocery yes. store for some the econ market. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For 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 the summer he came in and helped. And then we later have, on, used to have a grocery store. Econ market on um, on on uh what what we were what Third Old Avenue? Bay, Old Bayshore. Or the Bayfield, yeah. Old Bayshore. Bayshore, Bayshore. Bayshore Road. Yeah. We built it. So what other questions you want? I know you can edit this part out. Is there any other last question you want me to ask? Okay. That was nice. Okay. Thank you. Aren't they wonderful? I don't see Amy in her seat right now. Amy, Amy, are you there? I think we'll move to Dolly. Is that okay with you, Dolly? Dolly, can you hear me? Oh, here's Amy. Okay. Hi, Amy. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Next, it is my honor to introduce Amy Fong Albrighton. Amy entered the home at age eight in 1942. Please welcome Amy. Are we? Amy, unmute, please. Unmute. Say something. No. We can't hear, no. Oh, Hi, George. George, could you unmute her? No, we can't force her. We're not very savvy. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All, All right. right. Welcome. Sorry. Welcome, Amy. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Should I start now? Please do. Oh, all right. You know, I'm going to answer the three questions that uh, Elena listed for us to answer, right? The questions. Um, I was born in San Francisco on July 22, 1934. My father immigrant immigrated to the United States in 1928 and then sent for my mother in 1930. She died of hemorrhage shortly after I was born in San Francisco. Then I was, I spent the first year of my life living in a nursery in a San Francisco hospital. Yeah. I spent the next six or seven years at various foster homes before arriving at Los Gatos Ming Kuang on July 6, 1943, at the age of eight. I lived there for the next four years before going on to Mingguang, Oakland. Number two question, number two um, question was, what was it like living at Mingguang? My answer to this is, I remember very vividly the morning of my first day in Las Gatas, Mingguang. Uh, we were served breakfast with oatmeal and the oatmeal was very dense and gummy. 
that morning, we were supposed to clear, clear all our plates and I mean, eat all our food that was served to us. I did not do that. And so I sat there for over um, half an hour crying. It was not a very good beginning for me. As I reflect on our diet, I remember a lot of organ meat, for instance, liver, kidney, brains, giblets, and hearts, and blocks of bread. The bread is supposed to represent the staff of life. Okay, um, our days had a very fixed routine. A cow, bank, cow bell rang for us to arise around 6 a.m. and rang again when it was time for breakfast. The bell rang for every activity we did. After breakfast, we had to sit on a toilet that was assigned to us by age group and were checked for school, stool elimination before we could be excused. Similar to the scene from the movie, The Last Emperor. I don't know if anyone has seen that movie. Then we had our daily chores to do before we left for the one mile walk to school. These assigned chores were rotated on a monthly basis with heavy cleaning on Saturdays. In the summer in Saratoga, I picked prunes for 20 cents a crate. And in Campbell and San Jose, we cut apricots 25 cents a crate, earning about $1.25 a day. The money I earned was for personal items and church contribution. I had good training with the experience of saving, handling, and managing money. <laughs> there was a certain regiment to my life and the benefit of that regiment have remained with me to this day. I have a certain way of doing most everything and any interruption on my certain way <laughs> is frustrating to me. We, um, during the day, we put on plays and skits. The girls who was wanted to attend were charged. We were using rocks in order to see the, sh uh, the skits that we did, make these skits. We were uh, used, got rocks and used it as money to enter the, the play. I have no recollection of having a doll to play with, but we did play checkers, jacks, Monopoly, card games, hopscotch, tetherball, hide and seek, and for exercise, we jump rope and climb on monkey bars. We call that monkey bars then. There is one incident that remains vivid to this day. There was and still is a low quick tree close by that was off limit to us. One day, Paula, Paula Yin Wong, and I were caught harvesting a few of the loquat fruit. And our punishment was so, was, was this, uh, let's see what it was, okay. Skip lunch. Yeah, we were punished to skip lunch that day. We remember our experience of eating the forbidden fruit. We still had a good memories, my days at Mingguang, I especially remember the times when Miss Higgins and Miss Reber played the piano while we were played the piano while leading us in singing hymns. Miss Davis sang in the choir at the Los Gatos Presbyterian Church, where I was baptized at the age of 12. The following year, I moved to Open Ming Guang. Number three question is what impact our life, I guess. I want to say that religious training was an integral part of our Mingguang experience. We always prayed before every meal, went to Sunday school, church, every Sunday. For my past three required activities seemed part of a regimen and I did not develop any sense of devotion. This came later in life. Today I attend church every Sunday and sing some of the same hymns we sang at the Mingguang. 
This reminds me of my childhood, and it is, and it is during these times that I especially sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. All during my Ming Guang years, there was underlying value systems, discipline and character development being out into place, put into place, I'm sorry. As I look back, I see those same values gave expression, expression to my years working for the state of California and were transferred to my son and daughter, and we are all better for it. Looking back, Perhaps a less shelter life, I knew very little of the world beyond my immediate surroundings. I feel isolated, separated, and was aware of my differentness. We have not provided the opportunity to belong to Bluebird or Brownie. Not permitted to wear new clothes on Easter, like most other girls. We seem to be viewed as a group rather than an individual. Circumstances just seem to further isolate us from other girls our age. Nevertheless, I am indebted to the Presbyterian Church for providing me a safe place to grow up. There was laughter and good times, and the girls at Mei Kong gave me a sense of family and belonging that many of us share today. I want to make a comment about um, someone talking about uh, Dr. Shepherd. When I was in, um, on my own, I live on um, a Ming Kwang resident called Gummu in San Francisco. Uh, we, um, Ida, May, Ida Lee, Ming Kwang, she um, uh, took me to church on Stockton Street Chinese Presbyterian Church where Dr. Shepherd was a pastor. He was very inspirational to all the members at the church and all the students, the young high school, junior high, and they were very knowledgeable about the Bible. <laughs> that I felt kind of insecure because my knowledge wasn't in, in depth as it, theirs were. But, um, and what else is there? <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. huh? Do they want anything from your uh, uh, open? Do you want anything in my open Mingguang? Do I need to share something from open Mingguang? I'm asking you a question. Do I need to share something Thank on open Mingguang? Thank you, Amy. Thank yeah, you my time is up. Reflection. Thank you, honey. Okay. So, thank um, you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce. Dolly Tom Jang. Dolly entered the home at age five in 1947. Please welcome Dolly. Hi, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, a lot of the things that Amy said is uh, similar to what I'm going to say, but I'm going to go ahead and read what I have. Um, I came from a large family of seven brothers and two sisters. My mother died when I was two and a half and my youngest brother only one year. My father could not care for all of us. Some of us, some of my brothers were boarded out to relatives. And two of my sisters were given to neighbors or friends. Mm. I only knew of one sister, the other was given to a friend and no one knows what happened to her. Mm. I didn't meet two of my brothers until I was in the ninth grade. I lived at Ming Kwong home from 1946 to 1958, which was 12 years. Oakland Ming Kwong closed its doors at the end of my junior year of high school. From ages two and a half to five years, I was placed in nine different foster homes. The last was in Berkeley with the Black family. My father wanted me to go back to my first foster family, which was also a Black family. But social services thought it best to be with my own race. So I was referred to Ming Kwong Home in Los Gatos, where I lived from 1946 until I moved to the Oakland campus, Ming Kwong Home in 1958. After the home closed, I was placed with my sister and her family. I was only able to stay with her for three months. 
This was one of the scariest times of my life. The first was when the home closed, and then again. The second was, where was I going to live when my sister said it wasn't going to work out? I was confused, scared, and lost. Fortunately, one of the Presbyterian churches found me a live-in job with a family with two children in Piedmont. I was paid $25 a month. The first night I was told I would be eating in the kitchen because it would be easier to do the dishes and clean up the kitchen. After eating with a group of girls, Ming Kwan girls all my life, most of my life, I felt so sad. I really felt like a maid. So my senior year in high school at Tech High was not a happy one. I had to go straight home, back to the house after school. At the end of my senior year, after going to a picnic to celebrate my upcoming high school graduation, I forgot the time and got back late. The lady accused me of being late on purpose. I was so upset, she accused me of that. I was so happy to leave there when I graduated again. Again, I was homeless. The girl, um, a girlfriend invited me to live with her family. It didn't last. The landlord threatened to raise their rent because there was an additional person living there. I found an apartment with another Ming Kwong girl and I continued to work for the phone company. After one year, I moved, um, let's see, after one year, I moved to San Francisco to attend San Francisco State College and enrolled in a nursing program. I found another live-in job where, for the first time, I was considered a part of the family. I wasn't considered a maid. The mother, Claire, was like a mom. When I got married, I asked her to be, to represent as my mother of the bride. Okay, the second question is, what was it like living at Ming Kwong? Mm -hmm. I love living at the home. I have so many good memories, too many to list. We were never mistreated. We were all, we all liked Miss, Miss Reaver, the cook, Mrs. Ordway, who taught us to paint violets on cups and took us for country walks. Mrs. Lee or Lacey Nye or Mrs. Lin later tried to teach us Chinese, but, um, at that time, I think we were a little bit too old to learn it. <laughs> and we were all a little afraid of Miss Chu, who was strict, but she was fair. We always had plenty of playmates. We were never lonely. Living in the country, we learned to appreciate the outdoors. We played outdoors all the time and loved climbing the monkey bars, sliding down the giant slide, swinging on the giant swing, which hung from a big oak tree, and climbing the tall redwood tree. I also love going to Santa Cruz and camping at New Brighton Beach where we could walk the railroad tracks to Capitola Beach. We were taught responsibility at a young age. We were expected to do chores every morning before going to school. Even the youngest was expected to make her bed, do an assigned duty each morning, such as pick up the trash, sweep the porch, help with KP or lunches. We were also expected to wash our clothes and we used metal scrub boards. I remember doing that. And in Oakland, there was an old rig and wash machine that we washed our clothes. Christmas was a special time. While we didn't get many presents, I enjoyed Christmas caroling in the neighborhood and going to a Christmas party given by the Stanford Men's Fraternity in Oakland. Oh, no, fraternity. In Oakland, the home always got their Christmas tree from the Mills College. We decorated the tree with um, clear tinsel, gold or silver balls, and the tree was lit up with the blue floodlight. It was so beautiful. Birthdays were special. I don't think we got anything, but there was a birthday cake with candles and everyone sang happy birthday. Uh, one thing I remember is we, uh, we all had to have a teaspoon of cod liver oil each day and it was so nasty. <laughs> Also, I remember not being able to go to a movie because I also didn't finish eating my, my mush or my cereal. When we moved to Oakland, Ming Kwong home after the sixth grade, it was cultural shock. It was no longer the quiet country home we knew. I was amazed by all the city noises, automobiles, sirens, etc. Also, Oakland, Lincoln Elementary School was predominantly Chinese compared to, as in Los Gatos, we were the only Chinese. Religion was an important part of our upbringing. 
We are expected to go to Sunday school and church every Sunday. Prayers were said at each meal. It was evening devotions after dinner and learning uh, hymns while Ms. Reber played the piano. We were never hugged or showed much affection. We were expected to do our homework every night. We were only allowed to watch the one black and white TV for one hour before doing our homework. Okay, number three, what impact did it have living at Ming Huang um, or anything negative? We learned at an early age to be responsible by doing our daily chores and good morals through religion. We were taught to be polite and always say please and thank you. The negative thing maybe was in law status, we were quite sheltered from the outside world. We always did things together. We didn't participate in outside activities, such as Girl Scouts sports or go to parties or other classmates' homes. I remember one time being invited to a birthday party and I was so shy, I felt out of place. Our upbringing was very sheltered, strict and structured. We knew what, where, and what time things were to be done. We were not encouraged to make choices or express ourselves. I only completed two and a half years of nursing program because I lacked confidence necessary to interact with my instruct instructors or my peers. I got married in 1963 and it will be 59 years of marriage in October. I have four children, 19 grandchildren, four great grandkids, and five step grandkids, a large family. I worked odd jobs and worked as a teacher's aide for eight years at the same elementary school. I wanted to be home when they were little as I never knew my mom. I went back to Consumnes River College at age 41 and got my AS degree. I, at the age of 43, I went to work for Kaiser as a medical assistant and secretary for 20 years. I'm glad I lived at Ming Kong home for all those years as I didn't have to move from foster home to foster home. In closing, I was brought up with good morals, good Christian values. I hope I pass that on to my children. The highlight of my life is watching my adult children and grandchildren become responsible adults and contribute to society. I'm so glad Ming Huang found me. I'm a better person for having lived there. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story. Thank you. Thank you, Dolly, for sharing your story. I hope you enjoyed our Ming Huang personal stories. At this juncture, we are shifting our focus to our quest. May I again present Dr. Elena Wong Viskovich with fact or fiction. Water. We have become productive adults, parents, professionals, and contributors in our community because of Ming Kuang. We stand tall and proud of our survival and our accomplishments amidst a rough beginning in our formative years. We consider Ming Kuang our home, not an orphanage, nor we're going to dance next. Sam? We consider Ming Kuang our home, not an orphanage, nor a refuge for victims of human trafficking. The phrase victims of human trafficking is just a nice way of saying young women and girls from China kidnapped by the Tongs and the Chinese underworld of crime were sold to the brothels for profit as prostitutes and slaves in America. Fact, the rescue and housing of these victims in San Francisco at the Presbyterian Mission Home began in 1874. Over time, the Mission Home took in abandoned children and needy children in Chinatown. Soon the San Francisco facility filled to overflow. 41 years after the beginning of human trafficking trade, Ms. Cameron separated the victims from the young innocent babies and toddlers 
at the mission home by establishing Oakland Tooker Memorial Home for children in 1915. Fact, 51 years after the beginning of the slave trade, Oakland Ming Fong was established to care for young innocent Chinese schoolgirls beginning in 1925. The trafficking error was placed under different circumstances and was five decades past before Ming Fong actually opened. Fact, the Ming Fong girls have been falsely labeled prostitutes, orphans of prostitutes, illegitimate and abandoned babies by writers, curators, historians, college professors, and even students as evidence in the written and electronic media articles. There are even whispers in some of the Chinese community members saying Ming Huang residents were bad girls. False, Ming Huang girls are not prostitutes, children of prostitutes, nor illegitimate or abandoned children. You have heard from the timelines of the events, the context and the circumstances, as well as the locations of the social services of Ms. Cameron's noble work with the Chinese community. This refutes the mislabeling of the Ming Kuang girls and the cloud of misinformation that still hangs over our heads today. The victims of human trafficking have always been housed and stayed at the San Francisco Mission Home, while the innocent young school age girls beginning in 1925 were placed at the Ming Kuang homes under a different set of circumstances. Please help us correct the story and the history of the Ming Kuang homes. Uh, if you could. Here are some sources for you to find information about the Ming Kuang homes. Slide seven and eight. Okay. Maybe those slides can come up yeah, later. You, um, okay. And uh, if, I if I speak here, sure. everyone will hear me. We need to invite William and Richard back to the front of the room. I also need to let um, Raymond and Amy and Dolly know that you should stay here for answering questions. All, everybody <laughs> who was a um, panelist in person or by Zoom can answer questions. Um, people in the room can answer questions, ask questions. I will repeat them. Um, otherwise, the people in Zoom land will not know the question. Um, and the people on Zoom can ask a question through chat. And I will be monitoring the chat to see if there are any uh, questions showing up. Uh, OK, you're going to move the camera, David? Oh, great. Maybe we'll get closer. <laughs> oh, great. Does anyone have a question to ask of um, any of the panelists uh, here? or communicating through Zoom. Excuse me? Yeah, four attendees at Yeah, okay. Yeah, there are, are three um, panelists on Zoom, and there are four of them here. And if you have questions in general or questions for specific persons, um, go ahead and raise your hand. If you're on Zoom, um, put a message into the chat. We don't see the gallery. We just see the reference books. Can you put the gallery back on so that we can see each other? What? Excuse there me? That's fine. It's better now. All we saw was the slide of the reference books. We didn't see each other at all. Now it's better. We're good. Someone on Zoom is speaking. This is sort of a general question. 
I only heard that part about what happened in about 1874. Uh, so this presentation talked a lot about these people who were in uh, these, these homes and what the church did to these people. And I was just curious to see what happened to the victims in the 1870s, the young people who were in the same or in the Protestant hospitals. Did you follow up on those people in their history as well? Yes, there's a very good book uh, put out by Siler, and it's really about the slave trade. What was interesting is many of the women there actually became educated like up to high school. And um, one woman was Japanese, in fact. Uh, she became as a spokesman about human trafficking, went back to Japan, was highly educated, actually met with uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's uh, wife, and explained what was going on and how inhuman that process was. That's, that's just one. Some of um, the people there, they became, what is it, the... Uh, translators for the immigration service. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is a story about a girl who was uh, rescued when she was very young and uh, she actually married the uh, editor of the Chinese newspaper who was previous background was a uh, uh, minister and how she learned how to use her influence to help not only the mission home, but help the social services of San Francisco Chinatown. There are quite a few stories in her book, and, and I suggest you read it. There's always a church that created services for of these people. Well, the Presbyterian Church was a great leader in doing this. And what the difference between the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist, the Catholic and such, is that during those times in the 1870s, they would house the victims of human trafficking, but actually Donna Dina Cameron went and rescued these women. I mean, she went on the raids with the police and climbed the roofs to go down to some of these places. And the, uh, it's a fascinating story. To read it. David here. Hi, uh, I just wanted to take a of the stories from the women recently. I just wanted to take a fast to compare the con and contrast the women's experience and personal relationships. What was the question? Could we compare the uh, differences between the men and the women at Jonah and the women? I don't want to take the whole I thing. never knew about that until later. <laughs> the question was, did you want to repeat the yeah, question? So you can you summarize the question and then give an answer. Yeah, but I didn't even know specifically what you wanted. You have to repeat oh. the question, they can't hear it. Their question is unclear to them. Okay, let me try again. We, we've heard it say recently from women. And I was just wondering, from the voice perspective, for example, how would you think your experience was different than theirs? Oh. You know, there, there are differences in, in different organizations. But now that you've had an opportunity to, to hear their story, I thought perhaps you could come to Okay. Very easy. We're not involved with human trafficking as far as the boys are concerned. <laughs> I don't think we were prostitutes. We didn't have to worry about that at all. I think 
in my opinion, and William will agree with me, that Chung Mei Hong was more of a military discipline type of operation. We didn't have the opportunity to fool around. If you were low intermediate and younger, you had to wear a beanie so you would be distinguished. And on the bus that we rode, it says, Chung Mei Hong for Chinese boys. So it was very specific. And Dr. Shepard, our captain, made sure that, that we didn't get out of hand. And so, William, would you mention the Bank of Good Behavior, what Middleton Tom did? And did you ever get involved with the Bank of Good Behavior? Well, every Saturday, Captain would read a penal for all the uh, bad things or things that things that the uh, kids did wrong and needed discipline in. And there would be a list. Usually, the penal was you had to work off your crime. In other words, if you talked after lights were out, you would have to work one hour out in the field, whether it's sickling grass or helping with uh, picking up manure or whatever, <laughs> then uh, so be it. But every Saturday, he would read the penal list and it would always be a reminder to everyone around that you do the trouble, you do the time. You, know, you do the crime, you do the time. You keep your nose clean, you don't have to shovel the manure. Another thing is that they have what is known as a bank of good behavior. Like William did not do the crime. He was a good boy. So he got credit for being good. So if I did anything wrong, I would draw upon his bank of good behavior as a credit and debit, a credit and debit. And there was a guy named Milton Tom who came in at six years old and he died 11 years later, appendix son. He had such a wonderful bank of good behavior. They consider, the boys consider him almost like Jesus Christ because of the fact that he was so good. He was an angel. Anyway, before he died, his bank of good behavior, he did not do anything wrong. It was such a great credit that the boys who did wrong had a penal draw upon his bank of good behavior and did not in his balance because it was so much. So to me, Dr. Shepard was such a great man as far as picture language is concerned. The bank of good behavior. And last thing he did for me is he's wondered, he said, Richard, you did something wrong, but I am not gonna punish you. It's like breaking a, a beautiful plate. And he demonstrated that if I broke this plate, it's broken, but I can mend it back. But what happens? There's cracks in the plate. And he said that that's a reputation, but it can be passed on, we can forgive you. And I remember that distinctly. Number one, the bank of good behavior and the plate. That's what I learned. These are the values I learned. I'm sure that the girls learned something else because they have the similar concept. We had a lot of religion. I mean, we prayed in the morning before breakfast. We prayed at lunch on Saturday and Sunday. We prayed before dinner. And then after dinner, we had um, some religious education for about half an hour. We were also, they did attempt to teach us Chinese. And uh, some of us could say the Lord's Prayer and some of us just kind of sang around because for us, a lot of us didn't come out of Chinatown. So, you know, it was really foreign hearing Chinese. So that, that was different. But uh, please know that most of the girls paid more attention to the rules, but Jenna and I were the rebels in the group. She was 10, almost 10 years after me. And I was 11 when I got there. 
So I was a little sassy and I ran the streets of Chinatown. So to tell you the truth, uh, if I didn't like something, I used to just run away. I didn't even go to school much because I thought the teacher was stupid. Mm. So, you know, when I got to Minghua, you look around in Los Gatos, there's not many places you could run and hide because you stuck out by a sore thumb. You were the only Chinese in the area. So we had to learn how to cope and adapt. And one thing that Mary and Helen talked about that wasn't captured is mush or oatmeal. When uh, Mary didn't eat hers, what happened is she sat there for half an hour and that mush stayed there in front of her. And then she was punished for it. Well, she was there in 1933 on, right? I was there in 1953. And for the remaining teachers and missionaries there, they got soft because I had that lumpy mush that formed into a jello mold. And we had cotton napkins. So I would tell the house mother, look that way or get the girl to do that. I take that mush and throw it in the napkin. I threw it in the toilet. Little did I know that the toilet would flood and I got punished for that. And really, KP duty was supposed to be the worst, but it was the best because we all had Miss Reber and she was, I never knew this till, till about five years ago and I read her little resume. She came out of UCLA, and but she was our cook and she was so wonderful. You know, for girls that don't say anything, you gotta pull stuff out of them. And if they're feeling bad, they won't tell you they feel bad. They'll go to a corner or they hide or they cry, right? And I have to tell you, I was so upset because the first week I was there, Ms. Reber said, Elena, put some elbow grease into that because I was scrubbing the big vat. And I looked for that elbow grease for a half an hour. I really literally took that, it was some can of elbow grease. I came back and I was in tears and we weren't hugged because it was shown, it would have shown favoritism, but she did hug me and she said, Elena, that's a colloquialism and that's not what that really means. And she explained it to me. And you know, for a kid that was a rebel, if somebody explained something to me, then I accepted it. But if you tell me to do something, and I didn't like it, I wouldn't do it. But most of the girls went and did it, even though they resented it. So, you know, we're, we're different than the boys because the boys follow the rules. Uh, didn't quite work out that way for some of us. Okay, well, we've gone a little bit over time. I apologize to those who did not uh, get to ask their questions. Um, I'd like to, uh, before I make any concluding remarks, uh, give you another chance to express your gratitude for all of the speakers. Well, I, I hope you feel this has been an, uh, another successful uh, CHCP speakers event. Um, if you're wondering what's next for CHCP, um, in September, we're having a uh, gala to celebrate um, our 30th anniversary, um, 35th anniversary, sorry. Um, CHCP was founded in 1987. And there's going to be a gala event on September the 17th. So go to chcp.org and get information about the gala and about how to get tickets to attend the gala and enjoy all the wonderful entertainment, uh, raffles, auction, uh, modeling show, and so forth um, that we're preparing for you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay.